Hey everybody, welcome to It's Real with Jordan and Demi. I'm Jordan Edwards. And I'm Demi Ramos. And today we've got Judah Akers from Judah and the Lion. Judah and the Lion are one of those bands that you don't come across too often. These guys are killing it in the alternative world, but they're also a folk band. So they're from Tennessee um, in Nashville. The band has a guitar player. The band has a mandolin player and a freaking banjo player. So you can't get more original than that. It's super exciting. And aside from the music, these guys have an incredible live show. Like it's ridiculous. Um, They ramp up an audience like I've never seen before. So to me, they're just natural born stars. This is going to be cool. Yeah, they really take a lot of elements from different popular styles of music, popular styles on the, on the rock and countryside. They have that bluegrass feel. They've collaborated with Casey Musgraves, which I'm going to talk to them about. I'm really excited about that because I'm a big Casey Musgraves fan. And they also have some big stadium electronic drums, big sing-along choruses. So, uh, you know, we mix that all together and, and you can understand why they're so popular. You yeah. definitely hear... Aside from the banjo, the mandolin, you hear the influences um, of that's Nashville has had on them. And now we've got we got Jonah here. Hello. What up? What's going on? Good, good, good. How are you doing? Dude, doing well. Just uh, here in my house in Nashville. Where are you guys at? Are y'all in New York City? We're in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brooklyn. Nice. I love Brooklyn. You're. We were just talking about the interesting space that nashville is in right now that it's not just for country bands anymore you know um are you and you're still you're still based in nashville i'm still here i'm I'm in east nashville um the the guys in the band uh well brian actually is living in sweden currently um during sweden during this kind of like crazy time his wife's going to school out there since we're not touring um it's been kind of a really cool opportunity for them so Brian's there currently, but he lives in Nashville. And then Nate, our banjo player, he's in Colorado. That's okay. amazing. How has the quarantine been for you guys? We actually kind of, I guess, got lucky a little bit because um, we were in the studio, like, I think two weeks before phase one. Like, so oh before God. it was becoming like a real thing, I guess, in Tennessee, there was no cases or anything like that in Tennessee. And so we had spent like um, a week and a half in the studio right before. And then I think Nate was trying to get on his flight to come back to Colorado and it was kind of like uh it was like the, the very next week everything kind of struck so um got a lot done that week and then um yeah we've kind of been separate separate channels I mean obviously we've been quarantining um and isolating a little bit in that way and, uh, I guess last two months ago before Brian went to uh, Sweden we were able to get back together and um you know appropriately be in the studio together so it's been it's been kind of interesting for sure just like everybody else you've got this new single out and uh uh, beautiful anyway which is a really gorgeous song and is there more where that came from or how much did you get done while you had that studio time that song um, is it old is it like was recorded a while ago no we no it was like right honestly i'd we got back from our last tour. Um, we were over in Europe, um, and then we did the the um, we uh, we wrote the uh, the like soccer anthem for the new Nashville team here in town, and played that show kind of for their opening. And um, that was the last show that we played. And so um, no way. I guess November from that point, we had just finished like pep talks, our last record cycle, um, and that was the only show that we played. But right after that cycle, um, I was upstairs in my loft kind of just just doing what I usually do. It's like it's late night, I was feeling struck, um, inspired. Um, I I had this kind of like weird line in my head, at least from from me phonetically, um, that was like, I hope you see someday that you are beautiful anyway. And um, just over the course of the last few years for me in my life, um, just really, really knowing what like depression and anxiety looks like um, for myself kind of going through battles of that, um, mentally, um, get going, going back to therapy. My, my mom was a, um, a counselor growing up. So there was never really like a stigma for myself to go into therapy just cause my mom was a counselor. Um, but I, I think maybe because my mom was a counselor, it was like, I, I already have, you know, a counselor like with my mom, so I don't really need it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and very much discovered the last few years, man, That's how important super. it is to, to have, 
someone to lean on and to, to be to be able to kind of talk about you know through your mental stuff and um, our, our last record kind of implied a lot of those things that I was going through um, and hopefully in a very honest and genuine way um, but even after like shows or going to meet and greets hearing some of the stories from from people that um, you know felt connected to our music um, it was really heavy to hear some of the, the stories like um, it was like every single night someone's coming up and saying, you know, I, I wanted to commit suicide last year. The song helped me or, um, you know, my, my, one of my parents struggles with alcoholism as well and your stories. And it, it's just like, it was a lot to kind of, I guess, carry for me and to not, you know, in those moments that are like five second interactions with these beautiful souls that are coming up and like kind of pouring their heart out to me um and feel safe in that way but then i i really all, all i have time to say is like i'm sorry like i love you um let's take a picture and then get out you know that that's like about the time that you have and so i, I was like it's so really strange wanna... that must be so weird that you don't know this person at all you didn't know if i and they're telling you about this really intimate thing yeah i mean i, I think i don't know i've always kind of said vul like vulnerability um is contagious or vulnerability inspires more vulnerability and so I think that telling a little bit of my story I guess in, in the songs that um we put out through pep talks um I think I don't know it just like allows the space for people to be like oh me too you know like I, I struggle with that same thing and, and and it's so it's so sweet and it's like it it's honestly it's like it's kind of heavy when I start talking about it. I don't want to get emotional on you guys um but it, it's it's very sweet and you know all the all the things but also i'm just like man I, I really wish i could have said something tangibly to them in this moment as a human not as like a songwriter as a front man but just be like you're like so loved and you're known and all these negative thoughts that you're having you know i, I relate to them as well but please keep moving forward and go to therapy <laughs> like, you know <laughs> go go get help and go mm -hmm. lean on people and so beautiful anyway was kind of written from this spot of like what if if people are listening to the words that i'm you know suggesting or saying um it was a little bit of a, a cry for that and um a, a lot more like personal friends as well um nate's not on here but um he's been very open about his struggle with um depression and kind of self-hate and some heavier things um and I, I was just kind of thinking about my buddies and these people these beautiful souls that are coming up and are just struggling in a way um, so yeah, sorry, I don't even know if I answered the question, but it just kind of came out of, out of this like very almost spontaneous moment upstairs. I think I had written the song in like five minutes, um, and recorded the demo and just kind of sat on it for a little bit before I sent it to the guys. Um, and this, yeah, the last time in the studio, we were able to kind of record it and make it into what it is now. No, we so were that. Um, yeah, we re really appreciate it. Would you say, is this something that you and the guys have um grew up with um in terms of struggling with anxiety depression or would you say that your fame and your success has been something that you that you felt has alienated you i honestly i didn't really struggle with um that type of stress I, I was an athletic kid so there was like a lot of stress in my life when it came to like performance or whatever um in sports but never like socially anxious or never really um I wouldn't have said other than just like being bummed out, you know, when my dog died, um, I, I didn't really struggle with the form of depression. I think that I, I have struggled with in the recent years. Um, and mine came a lot just from, just from fam, like a lot of family stuff happened um, in the last, last few years. My, uh, my parents went through a pretty explosive divorce, um, which even as like a 20, you know, five year old, it just like rocked me. Um, I, I wasn't, um, I, not to say I wasn't prepared for it, but I just, I was just like, I, I wasn't expecting that to like really hit me as bad. My mom struggled with alcoholism um, in a really bad way. And then um, I had a couple of siblings, uh, or I guess not siblings, but aunts and uncles um, that have either overdo overdosed or committed suicide or, you know, a lot of like just kind of this heavy things where it just feels like, man, I feel out of control of this. Mm -hmm shit fest for lack of a better term that's kind of happening around me and um i think like like what we talked about earlier just like having an outlet like a therapist or a friend or music um, to kind of or music which is like you know 
way cheaper therapy. But um, yeah, I think for me, I, I think the guy, the guys maybe have a different different story with their versions of of anxiety and um, stress. I've never really thought about it with um, within like having you know fans or connection that way. Um, I think that it it is something that to talk about because I, I always I, I've kind of leaned on some of my friends a little bit here too that um, get a lot of get a lot of the stories whether it be in their like DMs or whatever that um, you hear like a lot of really hard stories from people like from strangers but people that I don't know somehow you're connected to or they feel connected to you in some way and um, and the, the the thing is, is like, it, you don't want to be a person that decompartmentalizes those stories and is not present in that moment. You know, when a 14 year old kid comes up to you and says like, I wanted to commit suicide last whatever. Um, and this really helped me. I, I don't want to be like, not present in that moment. But it's also like, uh, almost not it's just like this fine line that I've talked to is like, you, you, you can't carry that weight because it's too much for any person to carry like that many stories over and over. Um, but you don't want to be not present. You don't want to be a good human being. So it's like, you're kind of damned if you do, you're damned if you don't or, or some, something is like, it's kind of what we talked about. Um, so I think a little bit of that is probably added maybe um, to the, anxiety or whatever but i i don't i wouldn't i wouldn't change that for myself for my story like I, I love hearing the stories and the reason why i make music personally is to hopefully help people at the end of the day it's been about three or four years since your your breakthrough success in terms of mainstream radio play that sort of thing you know take it all back you know that was 2016 17 that that range do you think that's overall do you think it's had a positive effect on your on your mental health and your outlook on life or is is do you feel pressure to to duplicate that success well i think that's the that's the lesson right there is um you you can kind of fall into the swirl of like okay we have to repeat this thing that um for whatever reason had the success that it did um or i guess I, i'm more of like a, a fighter in this way like i want to fight against that feeling um, I'm kind of countered that, whatever that feeling is. Cause, um, even like with a song like beautiful anyway, I, I called, I immediately called, I, I was literally upstairs in my loft crying. Um, and I called our team, our manager. I said, Hey, I, I think I just wrote one of my favorite songs for Judah and Lion, but the bummer is it's, it's not super commercial. <laughs> I was like, it's not, I don't know, like it, you know, the message is kind of heavier, you know, and um, a lot of commercial songs for whatever reason you know aren't as heavy um and I was like it's kind of discussing like mental health and but it's it's got this like positive spin on it and kind of this like for lack of a better term like a worshipful ending that hopefully is empowering to people um when they sing it and um so I think to answer your question is I, I think that I, I've actually grown a lot because of it because I have had to learn to like fight that and I'll learn so much with take it all back too because um as successful as it was like also it was like our first kind of time where we were having this kind of moment in the public and um a lot of like hateful messages come with it within that as well and um that there just kind of taught me this this the same lesson that one of my mentors had taught me growing up was like you know don't let the uh, positive go to your head and don't let the negative criticism go to your heart keep it and, even keel yeah it's like, don't, don't believe the fluff and don't believe the negative. Just, just keep moving forward and, and keep doing what you think that you're meant on this earth to do and let the chips kind of fall, you know, fall where they may. So I, to answer your question, yes, I think it's, it's grown me a lot um, as a person, but I, I will say that I, I can see where it could make, you know, someone go crazy as well. Thank you for sharing all about, you know, the topic of mental health has been very um, important, especially in times like these. And your fans, people who look up to you and, and you're like, this rock, you know, like God, like my inspiration to live. You know what I mean? It's just, it's important that they hear that, hey, he has his down days. And um, 
and he's there for it and he's there for you and he's an example. Um, so I think it's important. And I, thank you. I'm really happy that you shared that. Um, you guys met while going to Belmont, am I right? We did. Tell yep. us about the scene in Nashville at the time. And did you guys ever imagine that the band would get so big? <laughs> yeah, what, 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 yeah, what was your aim starting out? Like, what were you trying to be? Well, it's kind of funny. I, I was uh, playing baseball at the time. So, like, my schedule at Belmont was, was pretty insane. I was a junior. Um, like, just as any, you know, college athlete, just the schedules are kind of insane. And I personally, being at Belmont, for me, I, I didn't really, you know, come with this, like, intentionality of like starting a band or even like I just between the three of us I guess more people are going to watch this so it's not just between yeah. the three no but be, no be, yeah, I, yeah, a few more people I didn't I didn't really believe in myself enough at the time to like really think that people would want to listen to my music or the songs that I was writing I was very passionate about it um but it was more like when when, when I met the guys it was like I was getting kind of pressured from my mom to make an EP she was like, I really like these songs. I think other people would like them. Um, you, she would just like speak life over me. You know, ha you have like a unique voice and I think you have something to say. And um, so when I met Nate and Brian, um, they didn't know me. All they knew about me is I was a baseball player. And um, I just kind of called them. I said, uh, you guys, I would love to just jam with you guys. Nate was the only banjo major at Belmont. Uh, Brian was the only mandolin major. Um, I kind of had this vision or epiphany or whatever you want to call it dream like with my music that this was these were the right instruments for it um we played that one day and then nate literally approached me like two days later and was like i think we're a band and i was like i don't even know what that means <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah we, we just made an ep and um we put it up on noise trade at the time it was like kind of right before the streaming became the streaming thing i think so we we didn't put it up on, or we put it up on iTunes for like a dollar, you know, a song or 99 cents or whatever. But then uh, we gave it away for free for, um, for an exchange of email and noise trade and ended up somehow getting on their like top spot, which kind of helped the downloads. And I think we ended up with like 70,000 emails or something at the end of the, no end way. of the campaign. And then we were like, we got to do this. Let's go. And so I finished baseball the next year, my senior year. Um, the boys dropped out of school and then we were kind of off. Um, but as far as like the, the musical climate, uh, what you were asking about Demi was just, it was very, very much, at least it felt like to me, like way more um, the alternative indie, whatever pop writing scene was way more underground then. It felt like, um, you know, there's a lot of nat national songwriters that, that I loved at the time that weren't country, but maybe they were writing country music on the side or whatever. But um, there was always kind of an energy there um, that was so beautiful to see. And, and Nashville is a, is a space, um, as you guys know, like probably like New York City. But for music, it's like you can either allow Nashville to inspire you or intimidate you. Like that's your two choices because everybody at Belmont is better at guitar than I am. Like, um, there's <laughs> a slew of great, amazing singers. There's, you know, and to, to try to even like, I guess, to differentiate yourself from that, it, it's the challenge and it's the fun part of it as well as an artist. Um, but to not sound like every other Nashville indie artist or whatever, um, it, it's kind of a, the, the challenge there. So I always tried to make the choice to allow my peers and people around me to inspire me and not to, uh, I guess, make me back down from, from the dream. Nashville, the country music machine, which you're around is based on hits. Nashville artists are all about like chart performance. And, but then on the other hand, you had bands like Jeff, the brotherhood, this, you know, really weird indie stuff. So you, I feel like you guys kind of landed somewhere in between that. Is that fair to say? I think that's probably that's kind of fair to say maybe i um i always think it's funny uh when people kind of i guess see the the cookville in me a little bit with with the music that i make whether because i'm from a small town in tennessee so there's a little bit of uh like i worked for my dad growing up uh, at a dry cleaners and he always had country music you know playing in the dry cleaners and so there's definitely some influence there with 
the banjo and the mandolin and some of our first EPs had like the slide guitar and we have, you know, um, so I, I think that's probably fair. I, I think for us, it was always kind of in our vision to make the fan base before we ever actually really went to radio. So we didn't have to, I guess, rely on radio for touring essentially. And so, um, cause that's always a fine line, right? It's like for some bands, um, and let, like, if they don't, if they don't have a hit at radio, then, you know, they, they can't tour. I think for us, we just like beat the crap out of ourselves for the first six years and Cletus, our van. Um, I think by the end of it, we had like 250,000 miles on her and um, played 250 shows a year, kind of just like put our heads down. And, and then we, we had a beautiful moment with take it all back that um, kind of felt like it really helped that story that was happening touring wise. Cause um, you know, it was just so fun for us to go to cities and, and try to like, or open up for bands or, or play in festivals and try to have that like winning over that happens at those, um, those festivals and stuff. That's so beautiful. Like maybe they come in and they're like, I hate that. Take it all back song. Um, but they end up loving the performance or something. And then, and then you have like, you know, a fan there. So that's what, it's what maybe kind of in the middle of there. We, I don't really, um, to go back to the, the writing of a hit, it's like, I think we, we just want to write music that's like genuine to us. That's our story that um, the people that are coming to our show, regardless of if it's on, on the radio or not, um, it's meeting that, meeting that person. I love I mean, that story. When, at the time when you guys were forming, this was the peak of that sort of folk rock as top 40 movement and things like, um, you know, Mumford and Sons and Monsters and Men and, Edward Sharp and that kind of stuff. What influence yeah. did that, did those bands have on you in terms of the direction you wanted to take your band? I think, I think it steered it a lot. I mean, I, I personally, um, I was more into rock music um, when, when all of that was kind of popping off. I, I knew the Mumford hit, the I Will Wait song, I think. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, the Lumineers, the, uh, Mumford and Sons of uh, Monsters of Men, Edward Sharp, obviously, um, all, all these kind of hybrids were even happening. Like even like what's happened with Casey Musgraves is, is so beautiful to me. She was just kind of like a hybrid of everything. But um, I, I would say that it had profound influence on us, and it, and also like it was challenging for us because I think after our first EP or something, that was when like the Mumford and the Lumineers comparison started, and so we were like even as like a nobody band, nobody knew who we were. We were like, how do we differentiate ourselves um, from like this, this comparison, I guess. Um, and that's where we kind of started leaning into more of like what we were influenced by and what the music that we love. Like, even though we love banjo music and, you know, bluegrass, like all three of us are way more influenced by like, Nate's like a big metal punk head uh, mm -hmm. growing up, somehow ended up playing the banjo. Like Brian was super into like, they're very classics like Frank Sinatra or Bill Joel, um, you know, the kind of the beauty, the beautiful music makers. I was influenced by like Tom Petty and REO Speedwagon and R.E.M. But then like I had such this hip hop side to me too, where I was like obsessed with 50 Cent growing up randomly. Um, <laughs> like down South Texas rappers like Paul Wall or, or whatever. Um, and so we, once we kind of started like really diving into who we were as people and as artists, that was when I think that we really kind of started to hit our stride, you know, musically. With those bands having that success, I'm sure you got some, you know, attention from record labels when they, you started putting out those EPs. It's like, we could, they could be the next, you know, Mumford, they could be the next Lumineers. So what was it like in terms of record labels, dealing with record labels and, and that whole thing during that time? Yeah, it was interesting. I, we um, because you know, they could see lot, there was potential for commercial success in you. Yeah, I think I think that was a big a big part of um, I guess some of the the bites for whatever um, or for lack of a better term that we were getting. Um, but also, like it, it honestly felt like labels didn't really know like what to do with us. Also, because you're um, harder, you're a little harder than some of those bands. Well, it was, it was just like, if you came to our show and um, obviously we had no hits, um, but let's say it's like, you know, 600 people are showing up um, wherever we're at in Asheville, North Carolina or something. And 
the, our, our shows, we tried to like, I don't know, like make them way more intense than what like a normal, and Mumford is unbelievable live. Um, so I don't even know what that means, but it's just like, I think we just love the energy of shows and that connection um, so much, but we didn't have like a, you know, a song that necessarily labeled, like would make sense for labels to put on the radio or whatever. And, um, and honestly for us, even when we were kind of getting these um, interests from labels, we, we had so many musical kind of mentors in our life that were super sweet to us early on and just, and just giving us advice that, you know, Hey, you need to like know who you are before anyone tries to make you um, what the, they think you should be. Um, and cause honestly we, we had opportunities to kind of sign early on and um, not, not that all labels are bad at all, but at the time, especially it was like, I think that we would have definitely been like molded and made into something that, you know, maybe we didn't really connect to, or maybe, um, you know, we didn't really want. And so I think having this space to kind of grow in that um, is so important for, for artists that are, that are growing up to, to really discover themselves. Cause I mean, I'm, I'm turning 30 tomorrow. Um, and Good. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to shout that I kind of feel like a jerk, but you know, twenties for me at least had been so much about self discovery and like figuring out who I am and um, what I want to say, you know. And, and I feel like bands or artists, it's like you, you you have to have that like process of kind of grinding and making a lot of mistakes and figuring it out, um, you know, before someone maybe tries to make you into what that they think that you are. Um, so we were we've been yeah we just been really patient patient with it. I love your band story because just hearing you talk about touring in the beginning, the crazy van stories and your hustle for the first six years, you guys are a true rock band. Like you have a real rock and roll story. Um, you guys put in the work and you developed a fan base based on playing shows all over. Um, and I just really admire that. Um, you do kind of have you. A, you do kind of have like an cool. old school origin story. Yeah, super you know? rare nowadays. Everybody just seems to be like some puppet in the industry. You, know? you didn't you didn't like po you know post a song to SoundCloud and then <laughs> be, or like put something on Spotify and you were a vi viral overnight. You know, it was it was years <laughs> of putting in that work. That's super super kind of you. Um, you mentioned Casey Musgraves. I love Casey Musgraves. Um, I cry when I hear Space Cowboy just like any other normal human does. And um, you have a collaboration with her on your last album, Pictures. Tell me the story about how that came together, how you, how you got connected to her and, and how you guys put that song together. Yeah, I mean, I'm obviously, and I'm like, I, I love Casey Musgraves. I saw her at Bonnaroo um, back when we were in college um, in like 2013 or something like that. And, just unbelievable. Um, but yeah, I've been such a big fan of her. I mean, she's here in East Nashville. She's kind of a, she's always been kind of the queen here. Um, and yeah, just loving her music. I, I'd written this song um, just kind of about this hard conversation I had with my mom about the divorce. And she, on this particular day, was like packing up our childhood home. And she had said, I just, I can't believe I'm taking these, like throw in curse word here, like these pictures off the wall. Oh and I, I was just so struck by it. And so I had written this song based off of my parents' perspective. It was kind of this moment where I was like, I think I'd been like really selfish in the, the whole like divorce thing as a kid, like woe is me and kind of like allowing those feelings. And I was so pissed off at my parents. And um, I, in that moment, like was like, oh, they deserve like so much empathy as well. <laughs> like what they're going through is way harder than what, you know, I'm going through, not that I'm not acknowledging what's, what I'm going through, but I, I was the first time I was kind of acknowledging what they were going through. And so I had written this verse um, based off of my dad's perspective and then based off my mom's perspective. And we were in the studio and um, I just had that memo from that day. And I said, I was like, guys, I really think this song is like special to the story that we're trying to tell, but it needs like this like powerhouse girl vocal on it um because my mom's personality is just so big and um kind of 
I would say more loud or, or not, not the Casey's that way, but just, just this powerful voice. Um, and so I was like, I don't think this would ever happen, but Casey Musgraves would be so into like, I would be so into Casey Musgraves singing the, the mom verse or whatever. And so just with Nashville connections, um, I was like, let's just at least try to get the demo to her ear. And I think she was in Asia at the time. So we didn't hear back for, for a little bit. Um, but just kind of wrote this email, sent her the song. Um, she ended up liking liking the song a lot and connecting to kind of the story that we were trying to paint. And um, literally, when I say it was as seamless as as like anything that I've ever done collaboration wise, like we met her at a studio in Nashville. We both went. We like talked about harmonies here. Um, she was very opinionated and very good with it like I, I like she, it, she could tell that she cared about the song like she wasn't just in there to go and sing like she wanted to assert herself which I really admired and respected I learned a lot from that from her um but we like two hours we both cut vo the vocals the final vocals and then we were done um super super rad I'll, I'll forever be a big fan of all Miss Casey absolutely absolutely Shout out. you guys have such an incredible live show I was just like talking to Jordan about it for like two hours. I was like, these guys are on a different level of rock stardom. Um, they not only how to know how to get an audience heated up. It's just, I don't know. There's just this kind of like God-like thing about you guys on stage. You know, you have all three of you. There's the three of you up front and you have an entire ensemble. There's just something really cool about what you guys do live. Was that because there's such a large ensemble on stage when you guys tour, was that difficult to um, incorporate in the beginning? It was, yeah. We had like a lot, a lot of different versions of kind of our, our live setup. So like the first tour that we ever did, um, we it was just the three of us, um, me, Nate, and Brian, and I had a kick drum that I played um, with my right foot, and then Brian had like a tom drum um, that he played. And so I think like for for us, and, and I would encourage this for every band that's kind of coming up, is you have to like, if you're, if you're gonna like go for it live-wise, you have to like, um, I, I, I had to talk with um, the 21 Pilots guys about this. It's like, you know, the bands that can do well live without the light show, you're, you're at the festival at noon, you're the first band, nobody really gets a crap. They're just there maybe to party early or maybe whatever. Um, the bands that like can learn to engage that person live that like is literally doesn't want anything to do with your band. He just randomly up. Mm -hmm. um from my perspective that like teaches you how how to perform like those moments like hone in on those moments and I, i'll never forget we were open up for incubus one time and um it's kind of a side story so sorry that's amazing but we literally yeah, <laughs> like we came out and um it was us then jimmy Eat world and then incubus and we came out and we had this like stupid dance routine that we did like right at the very start of the show um which i mean looking back we even said after the second show like this is kind of the, maybe the wrong market to do this <laughs> to do this dance um because they have all these like very classic fans and um we were kind of the the young band coming you know whatever but then we were like no that, that's who we are like that's who we need to be uh we literally in or portland oregon never forget it after we did they came out and did the dance um there was this couple in on the barricade in the front that literally crossed their arms and looked the other way during our whole set um, <laughs> so mean that's so mean well it's, it's aggressive like it was the first time like i almost like went down and like got you know you know i probably would have i almost made a mistake that day but what i'm saying is like that you learn from those moments where you know you don't have the big band in the back or maybe you don't have a lighting show or maybe the the you know, the hipster couple in the front doesn't like you because you're synchronized dance. But that that's just like who we are. And so like, I think now that we do have like the, the ensemble or, um, you know, the three guys in the back and sometimes more, um, it only elevates to what, I guess, the, the things that have made us who we are up to this point, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it, it was kind of harder to navigate, especially on like smaller st stages and stuff, because we were in Sweden one time and, um, 
we ended up having to like put all of our gear out on like the actual floor because <laughs> we didn't fit on the stage. <laughs> it, was a, it was a horrible show, but you kind of like make do. And that's what's fun about, you know, being in a band is kind of the, the, the years where you're really just growing. And um, like I said, just kind of figuring it out and allowing yourself again to make mistakes. Um, we always said, you know, for us, like if we don't go for it hard on the, the smaller shows, then we don't deserve the bigger ones. Um, so that's the, that's kind of the mentality we've always had. So it, it's, thank you for, for being sweet about our live show. I, we, we really miss it right now. And um, yeah, excited to hopefully play um, play again sooner than what everybody's thinking. You, you mentioned how spread out you guys are now. You're literally in different countries. So where is, I know you're, you're, you're obviously the, the front person and, and the main songwriter, but where does, where, where are you guys in terms of new music, writing music, recording new music? We had that initial, um, like a week and a half in the studio right before phase one, um, got lucky there. And then I guess we went like four or five months without seeing each other. Like we were all isolated in our respective parts. Uh, Brian was like in West North Nashville. Um, I'm in East Nashville. I think we had him and his wife over for dinner, like once outside, didn't like touch each other. It was um, a super COVID friendly uh, dinner. And then Nate was kind of isolating in Colorado. And then um, we were like, we had to get back in the studio but how, how can we do this safe? Um, and how, how do we be ethical about this and all, all that stuff? And so we kind of made the decision, we're going to pick two guys, an engineer and the guy that is kind of the, the fourth member of our band, Drew, who's, who's helped produce like all of our records. Um, we're like, it'll just be us six. We're, we're going to go in the studio. Um, and we did that, I guess, in August. And so we, we came in with two songs. We ended with like seven, five, seven songs. And we were like, I don't, I feels like we might be making a record. Um, I don't really know what we're doing. Um, so that was just kind of the start. I think, I think all of us obviously were creatively like ready to just kind of throw up creatively for lack of a better term. We were just so excited to get together. Um, it's the first time we had really played with each other um, since the start of it. So it was just so fun um, and electric. So we ended up coming out with more songs than what we came in with. So we're kind of in that fun process to get back to your question about new music of kind of we're we've, I guess pep talks have been out for a year and some change now. Um, we, we love that record. We got to tour that record cycle. We, we had um, a whole other tour planned uh, this last summer that we were going to kind of like finish it. But as far as other bands go, it's like we, we feel really fortunate to be able at least to be a year away from our last record release. Um, so we're, we're honestly just trying to figure out, you know, who we are again. Um, our dream has always been like, we want to be a band that allows for change and for development. Um, Cause I feel like as, as we grow as people, you know, we just, our ideas change, we get better hopefully and, and we're um, healthier and moving forward. And um, we're just trying to do that as a band as well. So we're in a fun lane of just trying to figure out are these singles are, um, is this also a new record? Um, we don't really know. We're, it's exciting. Why do you think you guys have stayed together for so long? What makes your personalities and your musical styles mesh so well? <laughs> a lot of empathy for each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you consider, do you, are, you, are you like close friends? Because some, some bands are good bandmates, but they're really not close friends. But you guys are close friends, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I would hate making music with people on stage that um, I, I think people wouldn't like watching us as well. If, if it, if like we didn't like each other. Um, we've always kind of said, cause you know, I, we actually had a conversation with our therapist about this. Cause we, we go to band counseling together. No freaking way. We do. That's a thing. <laughs> That's a real thing. It, it kind of is. And we, it, we were all like, yeah. we were in a good spot. Like it wasn't like we were, um, it wasn't like there was like big fights happening, but um, I think we've gotten like one argument. We're like, let's just go talk to the therapist about this and see if he can kind of like, help steer the conversation. I think like being in a band um, to, with our going back to the conversation with our therapist, he was like, you know, a lot of bands um, categorize or use the analogy of a marriage. Um, like it, it feels like we're in a marriage. 
And our therapist is like, that's not true. It's like, you aren't, y'all aren't like, you know, you're not married. <laughs> like you're not <laughs> attracted to each other in that way. You're not like responsible for like Julie, you're not responsible for Nate's life, blah, blah. Like what you guys have is like a brotherhood. Wow. Um, and for our band, that's so true. It's, it's, um, we're, we're, we're just brothers. Like I, I had those dudes back for, for the rest of my life. Um, I love them with my whole heart. We don't see eye to eye on everything and, and that's okay. Like it's, um, we're, we love each other and love each other. Um, in that way, we're not exactly the same people, um, as well. We all like kind of different things. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like, it's just this beautiful brotherhood that, that has allowed this music to happen, I think. Um, and I think like all of our different personalities and quirks and beliefs for lack of a better term, um, cause we, we all believe alike, um, enough, but some of that tension I think is what makes beautiful, uh, makes music beautiful at the end of the day. You mentioned you were trying to kind of find yourselves again. How do you feel about the, the, the place you're in musically? Do you like where you're at musically? Would you like to go in different directions? Is the new uh, whatever album EP that comes out next, will it sound similar to what you've done before? Like, where are you at musically? That's a great question. I, um, you know, we, we've all been like writing a lot, um, kind of individually. Um, and me writing for, for other things. And I've got an opportunity to, to write with, with other artists and um, write for some of the side stuff that I work on. Um, it's really taught me, I guess, the beauty of what, I guess, the magic of the three of us is, if that makes sense. Um, and I don't mean that in like a cocky way. I mean that in like, just like in a very practical way. Like it, it feels like we're very much kind of coming back home to who we are. Um, cause I've, I've been able to kind of like do this rock thing. And, um, I think where normally maybe I would try to like throw this synth on a Judah line song, but it might not work or throw this guitar line over, but it might not work. Or maybe it fits better with a banjo. I think it feels like it's allowed all this creativity, I think has allowed for Judah and line to kind of have this coming home moment. Um, that feels really raw, like it, like with Beautiful Anyway, for instance, um, very clear banjo and mandolin sound. Um, when I wrote the song, it kind of felt like this Irish, a little bit more of like an Irish da 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 song. And um, it, it, it reminded me so much of like our, our first EPs and our first record, but it also had like the bigness of, I guess, the the pep talks record or full cop and roll with um, kind of the, the big, bigger, like maybe pop anthem. So it, it feel it just feels like there's this like hybrid that's kind of happening naturally. And even in the studio, we were like, man, this, this feels wild. Like we only had like 12 tracks on one of the new songs. We we're like this, this feels amazing. Um, so again, we're kind of in that um, push and pull transition part of that, but it feels like musically we're, we're getting right way back to like our roots and like a banjo sounding like a banjo and a mandolin sounding like a mandolin. And my vocal is not, my, I don't know if my vocals have ever been like properly tuned, but like I'm out of pitch here and that, but that's rad. Maybe that's the story we're trying to tell. A more awesome. raw sound. What kind of band are you guys? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a good, that's a good way to sum more it up. Raw. <laughs> I could have just said that without. Having no, you're good. You're good. I like your descriptions. I like your descriptions. My my I wife's feel... always like, "Can you just like stop telling long stories?" I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just like who I am. This is a podcast. Podcasts are built around <laughs> long stories. You're good. You're good. What kind of band are you guys on tour? Because you. The three of you seem to be such wholesome people, but at the other end, you're freaking rock stars. You're touring the world. You're selling out places. Um, are you the type of band that's going to go book wild to 7 a.m. after a show? Or are you the type of band that's going to go home and get a nice rest for the next day? They talk about their wives a lot, so. That's true. Well, maybe <laughs> yeah, their wives all... party. It's, you know? Yeah, we, we're like we're like probably in the middle. Like we're not, um, we've, we've never really been crazy. Um, like we never really, I guess, I guess our vibe to, to kind of explain 
It was like after a show in Kansas City. We're I'm from go... Kansas City, by the way. Oh, sick. Yeah, yeah. We're going to go to Barcade. Barcade's we're gonna We're going to have a few drinks. And then we're going to go back to the bus. And then we're going to drink some water. And we're going to go to bed. So mm. it's like. Best of both worlds. Yeah, it's like a little bit of both. Like we don't, none of us like, like to get drunk. And none of us like to like, I don't know, just because that's just not maintainable for a band, really. And I don't know. We, we, are, we, like, we like to party, um, like barcade style, um, but we're not, none of us are too wild. And I think that there's an accountability there, um, like going back to the brotherhood that has allowed us to kind of stay healthy in that manner as well. well you, you grew up, you were uh, obviously a, a college athlete, so you had to discipline yourself in terms of keep, mm, taking care of your that body. That's true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Were you, uh, I'm, a, I'm a baseball guy, I grew up a baseball guy, big Royals fan, being from Kansas City. Oh, sweet. Um, were you like a pro prospect? Were you drafted? Do you have pro aspirations when you were at Belmont? Because Belmont's a big baseball school. Yeah, so when um, I, I was very fortunate uh, at Belmont because we, we had a great class uh, ahead of us. We had a great class behind us. Um, we happened to have some good players in our, our, our class. Um, I love baseball. Um, I love basketball. I, loved, I just love sports growing up. Um, but baseball, I guess, sophomore year for a college athlete, that's kind of on that. I was probably kind of on that middle line where I was like, I was probably a good enough hitter to at least go for it. Because um, I, I was, you, at that sophomore year, I think that was when I started getting letters, you know, from professional scouts and um, which is such a crazy and cool feeling, but it's like, what they all really expect is for you to go out and play summer baseball, you know, go to Cape Cod or go um, to this other summer league where I can like really see your development. And then it kind of shows them like, Hey, this guy's like working, working towards something. Um, right. And I needed a break from baseball. Like that was my personality. I, I, I needed to go and write songs or I needed to go um, just not, you know, not be around like, baseball and so I I, I kind of made this decision sophomore year that I was going to go after music um because I, I just was way more passionate about music um, I bet your coach loved that you know what he was he was actually pretty sweet about it like I he never really made me feel bad for not doing summer leagues he obviously wanted me to and was really trying to push me um but he also could see like the music side um of who I was as a person and I was like really respect um respect my coach um coaches for I guess allowing me to pursue this other dream that I had that meant a lot, you know, a lot more to me. Well, we will let you go. We really appreciate your time and good luck with the new music. And I hope you guys get to tour soon. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. You all really sweet uh, people too. Thanks for the encouraging words that you said about music, about life, all that. Hopefully we can um, come to Brooklyn and hang or meet you guys kind of face to face. And maybe by that time we'll be like hugging again. Yeah. Stay healthy. All the love. All right. We'll talk to you later. All right. See ya. Bye. Thanks for listening to It's Real with Jordan and Demi. I'm Jordan Edwards. You can find me at jordanedwardsstudio.com or on Instagram at jordanedwardsstudio. And you can find Demi on Instagram at demi underscore Ramos. Thanks for listening. <laughs>